Pay is a leading global retail technology platform offering consumers the flexibility to buy now and pay later. Brands have seen an increase in conversion rates, higher AOV, and lower return rates. Join the over 48,800 global fashion, beauty, and lifestyle retailers who have partnered with Afterpay today. Hi, this is our BOF Live. Today we're talking to Rick Owens. Um, this time, this time of year, Rick and I would normally back, be backstage before his show having an espresso. <laughs> so that's what we're doing today. It's a, it's a digital cafe clash, Rick. Some things just don't change. Some things will remain eternal, Tim. Our coffee, our pre-show coffee. Our coffee. Obviously, our um, since we last talked, um, not really even four months ago, the entire world changed. And it's really interesting. I remember we were talking about uh, the coronavirus. And you said to me, do you think this is the big one? <laughs> and at that time, obviously, we didn't really have any idea of what was coming down the turnpike. But what do you think? Um, what, what, have been, what have been, what have been your, your feelings for the last few months? Uh, well, I mean, with with all due respect to everybody who who um, was under tremendous stress, um, uh, we had um, the luxury of having a, a, enough space and enough trees to be able to ride out the quarantine in Paris, <clears throat> and. Um, and it felt like a reset. Um, but the other thing that my, 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 first, my first thought though was that it, with all of the contention and all of the ecological um, threats that we have going on, that we've had going on for so long, um, it's a miracle that something hasn't happened sooner. And we, haven't, we have lived this generation without a, um, without a world war. I mean, uh, generations before us have, have certainly been through um, huge disasters. Um, and in a world full of contentious people sometimes, um, it's, it's, it just seemed like, a, it was almost a sense of relief. Is, is that a terrible thing to say? But it was almost like, okay, something happened. I mean, it was bound to happen. Something was bound to happen and it's happened. And how are, and, and other people have survived um, this kind of disaster before or, or, or similar um, hardships and how is this generation going to, I mean, we're going to survive somehow um, altered, um, but how do we get through this gracefully? Um, do you want to see where I am actually? Look. Yeah. Just to set the tone, where I'm like, oh my God, you're in Venice. Uh, you're losing the signal, though. Yeah. But this is where I landed. Um, but anyway, back to Paris. We were isolated, but now, when you isolation said, for me. When you said you'd been at the beach. You had just been at the beach. Literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just came upstairs. Yeah, and then I'm probably going to go back after, right after this. Um, I, I, I kind of thought about just doing this from the beach, but um, the, the sound wouldn't be good. So, um, but anyway, isol isolation in Paris in our house was was not um, certainly it wasn't a hardship, um, and I have nothing to, to complain about. And we had um, it was it was uh, it was this it was a time to reflect and there was obvious threat outside the door which only made us appreciate and be more grateful for everything that we had and to be able to have some time to kind of focus on it and um i thought um my responsibility in in what i do is to is to be part of an aesthetic voice of this generation which sounds really lofty when i when it comes out of my mouth but it, it, it's kind of true. So um, I felt um, 
this is not my this is not the night before my runway show this is this is science's moment um and all of the people in relief efforts um so my responsibility was to study and to absorb um no to study to study as much as i could so that when my turn to contribute came i would be ready um and that's what i did i just um, concentrated on absorbing as much information, um, aesthetic information, that would serve me, that would nourish me or serve me in the future, uh, collecting <clears throat> thoughts and inspirations and aesthetic history. Um, and that was my focus. Um, and I hesitate to say that it was a really beautiful thing. And it was almost more beautiful because there was a poignant side to not knowing whether I would ever be able to exercise any of this information or, or use it um, in the future. But that's, it doesn't matter. I mean, the point of life is that you just do your best um, because you know that eventually it will end. But while you're here, the whole point is to um, contribute and participate as best that you can. Um, so that was my focus during quarantine. When you say you were collecting this aesthetic information, where were you collecting it from? What were you collecting? Books, mainly books. Any specific kind um, of or place? Or? I, I, I was studying. I was studying people like E. W. Godwin, the furniture designer, who who had who I'd never realized was such an important part of the aesthetic movement and the pre-Raphaelites. And I'd originally just started noticing him because of all the Aubrey Beardsley furniture. Um, and then I found like in, in, all of, in a lot of Aubrey Beardsley prints, um, there's this kind of unique spindly furniture. And then somehow I found out it was kind of, it, it all was E.W. God, Godwin and then I looked him up and started researching him. And then his connection was with the aesthetic movement. Um, I, I, I just, I didn't, I hadn't realized um, how important he was. Um, and then he, then that led me down the rabbit hole of, of he had been collected by um, um, Doucet, Jacques Doucet. Is it Jacques Doucet? Yeah, Jacques Doucet, the um, French designer who we really don't know that much about his clothes. Um, but he was such an amazing, co his collection, he, he, he was the one that originally bought um, Picasso's Le, um, Le Demoiselle d'Avignon um, and Rousseau and um, and the first Eileen Grays. I mean, his collection is like the catalyst of, of all of all of the some of the most important things that we look at today. Um, and I remember going to the Saint Laurent Foundation because they did a show on Jacques Doucet's art collection, and um, it's just really impressive all of the stuff that he had that he collected he just um and then when you compare it with his clothes because his clothes were a little bit conventional but his collection was um the most avant-garde of the avant-garde i don't know i don't know how that happened but um he had an original eye he really did it's spectacular but you know uh, are you are you thinking right now when you when you were doing your aesthetic um, kind of harvesting. You know, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the period that you felt was a huge influence on you when you were in your most formative years, which was, um, I think you described them as, um, I had to write it down, uh, black and white, um, by black and, silent black and white Bible epics. And yeah. uh, I love the fact you it's said, you told, you told somebody, you told one of your interviewers, one of your inquisitors, that you would watch Na Alan Nazimova's Salome in bed in the morning with Rudolph Valentino, one of the co-stars in that. 
And I saw that in your exhibition in London. I watched that. Um, I watched that, that that was screened in your exhibition. And you know, it's so interesting that that was all being produced out of the mood that was created by World War One, and that all of that, all of that intense sort of hyper. I, I don't want to say decadent, but hyper sort of uh, acute asceticism was a reaction to global catastrophe. And I'm just wondering if you feel we're in a similar situation now that we might see, and you could easily be a sort of leader in this kind of movement, if we might see a similar kind of hyper aestheticism, a sort of very refined, um, very sort of creativity or or, or, or bust response to the, the current crisis? Well, now that you're talking about it, it, it seemed like it was an explosion of sens sensuality. Um, and transgression as well. Well, sensuality just kind of borders on transgression anyway, especially, well, during that time, especially. Um, and I've always, I've, I've always been kind of fascinated by Art Nouveau because it's kind of foreign to me. It's, it's, um, there's tremendous appeal in, in, in the whole collapse to it. It, it, it. it really is about giving in to your id and about, about a morbid collapse kind of. Um, and I, I've been thinking about fashion as a reaction to um, wars and um, I hadn't really been thinking that much about that particular example. I was I was thinking uh, I was thinking about Dior too. I was thinking about Dior um, after the war being a reaction and being a um, an explosion of opulence after deprivations um, and. When we look at it from the from from this generation, it seemed it seems very obvious and very first degree, and I'm not sure if it was at the time because it was an obvious. Um, it was almost it, it was almost offensive because people had been um, under so much hardship and and yardage. Just, just fabric yard. It just, it was, it, it was so um, <clears throat> um, rationed, and then to have this the explosion of longer skirts with you know forty meters of using forty meters of fabric, there was that was transgressive, and um, and just that. But people responded to it. It could have been so offensive that people would, would have rejected it, but instead they embraced it. And I kind of wonder why, because it does seem like it would have been offensive. And there must have been, the way it was done and that gesture at that time in history, there must it must have been perceived somehow as wit um, or as um, a bold gesture that, that, you know, sometimes it can teeter on ridiculous or grotesque, or it can end up on the side of chic and people decided it was chic. Um, Cause it's hard to imagine that, that um, something that first degree would have worked. Anyway, that kind of, that kind of example would not work now, obviously under these conditions, because I think there's a, I think there is a underlying suspicion that we brought this on ourselves and um, something as self-congratulatory as opulence after this just wouldn't work. But, um, but complete minimalism and um, um, guilt isn't really going to work either. Um, if you look at that example, you would think that this, during this period, fashion after this would become very um, conservative and uh, modest. And I think 
that with information ricocheting back and forth so much now, I think people have already gone through the period of um, of modesty, and and maybe they're all maybe they are ready for opulence again already. I'm not really sure. I wonder if you know. I wonder if the word is indulgence because obviously England has been on lockdown and the weather is gorgeous right now and i just there was a news flash that there's been a state of emergency declared in south england because the beaches have been flooded with thousands and thousands of people and the local authorities can't handle it so they've declared a state of emergency so i'm wondering you know it's that sort of polarity we have the incredible the lockdown where people were very very obedient and followed uh, the guidelines they were given, um, bar a few of our um, leaders, <laughs> few people who, a uh, few people who considered they were above the law and disobeyed the, the regulations, which of course has unhinged people as well to think that they can do it. And, th and then there comes the moment where they can actually be free and they just go boom in the other direction. And the new look is kind of a, is kind of a nice, is sort of symbol of that of that reaction to restriction, you know. And I, I, people, I, I think you can't resist the sun and being outside because that just feels healthy. And I think um, nobody can um, nobody can feel that that's an indulgence. I mean, I think I, I, I think just your instinct tells you that that's what you're supposed to do. Um, the other thing I was thinking about though, when it, uh, regarding fashion, though, was one of the things that I've really liked for the past five years is that people are talking about responsibility and that didn't used to be a part of the conversation before, that's recent. The idea of responsibility when it comes to luxury. Um, and just that in itself is a tremendous stride and it has become, uh, it has become a gimmick um, sustainability and transparency has become a gimmick that a lot of people are um, on a bandwagon about. But if it's even if it's a gimmick, so what? It's a great gimmick. Um, so let it be a gimmick because I mean, if 3% of it works, that's, that's still a good thing. So, um, um, so we're having this conversation about responsibility and then something terrible happens and afterwards, um, responsibility is going to be an even stronger uh, um, direction. I think it has to be. Um, so somewhere, there is going to be some kind of witty responsibility. Um, whoever can do it in a witty way is going to win. Can you... Um, I haven't figured it out yet, <laughs> but I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I would say, um, you know, it's interesting, but I, I was reading back. We have had some really penetrating conversations over the last decade or so. And this is where I was so happy we could do this because I knew I was going to miss, um, miss that, uh, our talk this season. But your commentary has got more and more pointed over the years. You, you've, you've gone from talking about living and working in a bubble to being a lot more engaged and even down to those last two collections, the last men's and the women's collections, ironically feeling like they anticipated in a strange way, in an eerie way, where we are now, where you, where you would be saying bigotry is my bet while. What do I say? What is my bet noir? Bigotry. Bigotry, bigotry is your right. bigotry. Where you felt compelled and comfortable making your collections a comment, a rebuttal to bigots. Well, I felt it was a responsibility. Yeah, then we would just say responsibility. Yeah. 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 And I mean, right now we are living in a situation where, which has been considerably worsened by bigotry and by um, ignorance and by greed and, self and, and um, 
selfishness. Um, Isn't it amazing how it's gotten this far? And so I would, I, I would have thought it, it would have been so blatantly apparent and grotesque that something that I mean, and it's so obvious and we've all so many people have recognized it and and spoken about it that, that somehow it would have there would have been enough of a reaction so far, but maybe it just hasn't gone far enough. Um, maybe we're still waiting for the bigger for a bigger reaction. I'm not sure. Or a bigger a bigger challenge. Even. The big one, a and, bigger yet, what? and yet a bigger challenge. You know, that when you say, "Is this yeah. a big one?" and we weren't sure if, it was, if 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 this was a big one, we still don't know. We're still kind of forms of uncertainty. But at the same time, you you do say you you do say something like, "The world needs beauty," and that's one of our greatest gifts while we're here. So. Beauty and play are one of life's greatest rewards. I mean, when you, um, when your survival is somehow um, under control, when you have, when you have enough food and you have enough shelter, um, the next, the next thing to do is play, um, and adorning oneself and communicating through the way you look is a, um, it's it's an ancient ritual. Um, so, and it's an important part of communication. Um, it's, it's one of our methods of communication. So yeah, it's essential. And you know, when people are talking about our fashion shows over, um, I really, I no, um, they'll always be there in one way or another. Um, I think balls in like, um, you know, in the 17th century were a version of a fashion show. I mean, they were, they were people gathering together um, and adorning themselves and in subtle ways communicating with indicators. Um, so that's never going to go away. And especially when there are analysts like, like you who um, analyze the way people present themselves and, um, and, and, you know, in, in the fashion world, there's a couple of people that analyze things in, in the most beautiful, cultivated way. And I'm trying to think of how many there are other than you. And I'm not. Well, it's I'm very not, sweet to say that. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you totally deserve it, Tim. You totally do. Like, and that's, that's, that's why I'm here. I mean, I, I um, you know, I don't really like to explain myself that much because either you get it or you don't and that's fine it's it's kind of there's no amount of explaining i can do that's going to make you appreciate my stuff i mean it really has to it, it just has to work on first impact i mean my explanation is not going to be there when somebody's in a store looking um you know among thousands of racks uh, my explanation is not going to be something that convinces somebody to buy my black skirt so, um, but um, like I've always said, going through these things with you, and it, it's great because a lot of times you kind of you kind of touch on something that I kind of hadn't realized I was doing, um, and when you mention it, it hits a chord, and um, there's like a, there's a little jolt of recognition that that, um, um, and sometimes I wonder, am I just agreeing with something that, like an analysis that I liked, that I appreciated, and I, I don't think so. I think I'm, I'm agreeing with, um, I think I'm recognizing something that I might have not um, been able to put into words maybe so much. Um, uh, that, why is that? It, 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 uh -huh. if, if I'm saying things to you, you're saying things to me. So it's a completely it's a complete yeah. dialogue. I mean, and that's a conversation, and that's yeah. what fashion is. I mean, in the most subtle ways, that that is exactly what fashion is. You, we're 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 telling people things and we're about ourselves, and um, and it's not always about status or um, or beauty. Sometimes sometimes it, it, there are more subtle indicators, and it, it's about how to live life in a dignified way, maybe, or how to. Um, or kind of suggesting values as some other people might agree with. Um, so yeah, I don't, 
fashion's great. <laughs> but I wanted to I wanted to ask you about survival because we were talking about when we talked about survival before it was in a sort of oh how do how do you create a a sort of a, a kind of image bank that uh, resists the instant the immediate sort of gratification of of Instagram how do you create something which is more thoughtful and provocative and so on but now survival means something different so now survival is obviously a lot more it's a it's a much more primal issue in the light of what's happening now so how do you envisage survival now for yourself um how i mean a part of that is how important were your shows as a mode of communication i mean where will you create that impact now well the last shows that you were talking about i was i was thinking just going back to that i was i was just thinking about um um well, Tim's not here to analyze this, so I have to do it myself. Um, <laughs> with I, I was looking at those shoulders, and I was thinking, where, what was what was the deal with those? Why was why did those shoulders just feel so right to me? And I was thinking, um, you know, shoulders have always been about power, um, but these shoulders were um, they were more borderline ridiculous, and I realized it was defiance. Those shoulders were about a defiance um, in in the face of threat, something that's always kind of fascinated me. And, and to connect the dots kind of, like when I was in quarantine, um, I gravitated towards, I started listening towards to um, my, some of my favorite, the endings of my favorite operas, um, Salome and Electra by Richard Strauss. And those endings, the finales, first of all, I mean, the whole story, the storylines of both of them are just people people having a sense of urgency in the most misguided directions. <laughs> um, and then in the end, you know, everything falls apart and they then and they they have this transcendent orgy of emotions and then die. And somewhere, I was thinking, and after after quarantine, I was thinking, I wonder. Um, I was kind of thinking about endings and and the most defiant, the most glorious way to to do that, and how, um, and that's kind of what why I was focusing on these operas because it, it felt like, well, if this is an ending. What's the best way to do it? Who, how has it been done right? Um, and that I was kind of, um, kind of studying that. Um, I was also reading um, Edmund White um, for some reason. I just started reading. Uh, there was that book, Unfinished Symph Symphony, about um, about um, his lover's death and and how they negotiated that and how they dealt with that. And, um, and it, all, it all kind of tied together. How do people get through um, endings? I've been reading Paul Monette, which is very, com very compatible to Edmund White. Did you ever read um, Andrew Holleran's Dancer from the Dance? I, I never did, but I know I should. Oh my God, you have to read that. I mean, we might be too old now. I mean, that was kind of a formative book um, in my earlier years, but uh, I, that was always, um, that was rapturous doom. It was just, the whole thing was doom, but in the most rapturous, transcendent way. Um, I probably learned a lot from that book. Actually, you you did say one of the last times we talked, I romanticized Doom. I do. And that's part of my, that's what I've been doing for a long time. But it's not new. I mean, that's, um, I think a lot of Art Nouveau was about that. A, a lot of Art Nouveau was, it was about a somber, um, decadent descent into Doom. Um, and after that world war, I, I think maybe that was a way of coping. Um, um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've been romanticizing doom a lot. Well, I wonder when you said the shoulders were about power, 
I was kind I of learned about power. I realized they were about defiance. It wasn't oh, about, yeah. well, but power, yeah, to a certain extent it was, yeah. You also called that show Performer. And yeah. was, I thought the shoulders were about performance because, you know, Joan Crawford entered a room, basically like a stegosaurus in a way. I mean, they were like Betty Davis and Joan, Joan Crawford were like the dinosaurs in an Edward, in an Edward, um, in an Edward, Ray Harryhausen movie, you know, that sort of um, competitive, uh, that competitive dinosaurian bulk. I mean, that, that was in those, that was in those movies that you love as well. That's yeah, sort of dinosaurian, I'm going to use that word a lot. Dinosaurian. <laughs> dinosaurian. Well, you know, Goethe Demeron, Twilight <laughs> of the God. We're kind of there, aren't we? Um, I, I have uh, one thing that, that, I mean, you give good quotes. You really do. I, I, I hope that there is, uh, there is that one day that your your there's a, there's a book of um, Owen's isms because uh, they're so instructive. One that I I've, I've seen an Instagram. Um, there's an Instagram. What do you call it? Um, feed called Rick Owen's quotes, I think. And it's it's and I've gone to I've looked at it, and um, yeah I, yeah some things kind of turned out good. Well. You know, you say defiance, and I think defiance is very important, and I think it's something that um, has come into the, the collections in a different way, because I think there's always been a defiance. You've, you know, even defying bigotry, defying orthodoxy, defying narrow-mindedness. I mean, these things that you've done really well, but the sense now, the last few collections, where you embrace glamour, and you talked about Kansai Yamamoto's clothing for David Bowie, and and you and you you actually said I, you just didn't have that much to lose anymore. That it, it, it was kind of like a a complete a statement of complete liberation. Like you felt that you were at a stage in your life where you had nothing left to prove. You 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 were doing this for yourself from now on. Well, I think I, I, that might have been literal in the fact that I was lifting Kanzai Yamamoto so much that I was um, quoting him so much in my shows. Um, I think that's why I said that, that I have nothing to lose. But I meant that because um, at this point, I've kind of established what I do and who I am. And um, I, I don't think I'm really going to be accused of, of, of being somebody who rips people off that much um, anymore. Whereas earlier, you know, I, I, I might have been. Um, so, who did you work off? Uh, huh? off? Well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been possible without all of, without a lot of designers before me. I mean, there's a lot of designers that obviously, um, well, you know, I'm not going to give a list of names. But <laughs> <laughs> you can say Charles uh, James, for example, because he's not here anymore. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, let's talk about VNA and Madame Gray and Fortune. I mean, all of those guys, I, I totally, I totally ripped them off and I still do. Um, but I mean, you know, I've always said that like creation is, is really usually a, a composition of things that have come before. It's just a personal composition of, 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 of uh, and that's your invention. Your composition is, is your invention. I mean, everything, I mean, VNA was, copying um roman ant antiquity and um god knows what charles james was was copying like ships or something i mean his, his stuff was so architectural and yeah, uh, yeah. So, um was i answering something no i was know? we were talking about how you said you had nothing you had you had nothing you uh, didn't right anything. More. And that, that, of course, makes me think about, we've talked about legacy and you're, you know, it's so interesting that legacy is always, people, if people get sort of antsy when you ask them about legacy because they think that you're talking to them about being irrelevant or something. And I loved that you, you, you had that incredible exhibition in Milan, which was, I, I just imagine somebody who'd never heard of you 
walking into that show and just feeling like they had walked into a sort of a civilization that was pre-human, post-human or something. But you even call the show subhuman, inhuman, and superhuman. And do you feel that that's the kind of arc of your, of your world? Um, I, I, don't, I think it's, it's not an arc, really. It's, it's a cycle that keeps repeating itself. I think, and I think it applies to all of us. I think we all feel there's, we all have moments of self-loathing and shame. Um, and then we all are capable of cruelty um, and of bad behavior. And we, um, and then there are moments where we can rise above it and learn from all of that and become um, better people. So I think that that kind of that um, title just kind of apply to the human con condition um, and things that were, and, and that's kind of been my message all along, I think. I mean, I hope that's that um, uh, self-forgiveness has been a, a big part of, of what I've, I've tried to tried to get across um, because we've all felt inadequate and um, subhuman and We've overcorrected, um, and we have um, overdone it sometimes. And at at the end, the, you're hoping you kind of reach a balance where you kind of understand what your flaws are and how to work with them, and how to um, make yourself better and how to do your best. And that's all you can do. That's the best you can do. Um, so that's that's what that title was kind of suggesting. Um, that cycle. Do you think superhuman is the state of serenity? That no, actually, I don't. I think superhuman kind of suggests something kind of more chilly, more cold, more um, super controlled, which isn't, um, which is appealing, which is 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 sexy, but um, it, it's not realistic. It's not realistic. Um, like and it, the, the idea of, su of being superhuman has been um, a great source of conflict over the years. I mean, idealism that just, that just um, becomes fascism. I mean, that's, that's um, a cycle that we've seen over and over again. But if somebody said to you, um, Rick, I'm gonna give you the power of immortality, what would you say? If some superhuman, uh, yeah, sure, I'd take it. <laughs> would you be immortal? Would you be immortal if you could be? Um, wouldn't anybody? I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of the urge that makes that moves us forward. That's that's what that's what motive. Well, maybe it's not. No, it's death that moves us forward. That's true. Um, the fact that the urge to leave our mark before we're gone. Um, Maybe immortality would just um, let you relax and enjoy things. Uh, um, I'm not sure. But it, I, I, I find, you know, because we get so wrapped up in our own little worlds, and I think that's one of the great flaws of our time, as you said at the beginning, we haven't had those enormous, well, until now, we haven't had those enormous challenges like world wars and plagues, and, and our, our society has been able to form itself in a fairly sort of, well, savagely flawed, but but um, I, I I did I'm always I always wonder what the future will make of, of this time. You know, in 500 years, if 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 there's anyone left to analyze what what we were doing, what do you think people would be saying? Well, there's such heightened sensitivity. Um, I I. Um, you once said you looked forward to being. Uh, an obscure figure who was rediscovered in the future. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always wanted to be an exotic fashion footnote. That's that's my that was my goal. Are you disappointed? 
Um, I think I, you know, I think some of the people that I think some of the people that have, were interested in me are. I think I, I've, I've um, I think I might have come off as a sellout to a lot of people just for the fact that I lasted this long. I mean, and you were successful. <laughs> yeah, that that I, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just a little, I wonder if this, this, this heightened, this, this excruciating sensitivity and squeamishness is going to reach some kind of fever pitch and kind of just collapse. I'm kind of, I'm hoping, I'm hoping so, because it's not very realistic. Um, idealism is great, but, um, um, there's a lot of malice out there. <clears throat> that concerns me. Well, you you did say that um, evil is ever present. You know that that evil is in a in a strange way. Evil is uh, the whip that makes good better. You know, I guess vice versa as well. E but whip good is the whip that makes evil worse. But yeah, e it, it, there seems to be some sense, some kind of purpose for, for evil um, and, and um, I don't know if that's being fatalistic or realistic. Yeah. Um, Pragmatic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember, I remember one time my dad told me, I, don't, I can't remember, I was in a fuss about something and he told me, Richard, life isn't fair. And I remember, <laughs> I remember just turning red and boiling um, and with fury um, that, that, my, that my condition was dismissed like that. Um, now I get it. Um, and I think about it a lot. But do, are you talking about responsibility? In a sense, do you feel like you're you're in a, you feel like you're in a place where it's your role to write those injustices in a way that no, you're in a, I don't think I don't think I'm going to write them but I really think that I need to perform, per, to be some kind of ballast I need to balance it out I need to um and, and maybe balance it out sometimes in kind of flamboyant transgressive way maybe in kind of an extreme way just because uh um because uh, that's the best we can do. We can just kind of, we're, we're not going to cure it, but we can we can balance it out. It's a matter of degrees. Um, so I do feel a sense of responsibility. I mean, you know, when I do a video like butt muscle um, that is in theory transgressive, I feel like I feel like it's creating it, it's a I feel like it's a responsible balance to um, to bigotry and um, and cruelty on, on uh, in the other direction. Well, Christine is an icon. I mean, you've, she is an icon of something. Maybe be a saint. Yeah, a saint, Saint Christine. I I, I agree with that. I, you know, you you when when you got in touch with your Mexican heritage, your mother being Mexican, you you did, you did collections that paid uh that saluted her heritage what response did you get to those did you did you have people uh, especially from her, her, did you get a response from her community in in mexico did people feel that that was a that was a useful statement for you to be making um not really but i'm not really i'm not um I, I suppose I'm not somebody that I, I don't really go out there and, and solicit, solicit responses or um, kind of my only engagement is through is through my clothes. I don't really have conversations about it. I didn't. I didn't really get a response, but I don't I'm not. I didn't need one. Mm -hmm. um, just the act of doing it, I felt was just putting the right energy out there. And 
Um, yeah, I, I didn't, I wasn't really looking for one or didn't need one or I'm sure it was out there. I'm sure, I'm sure there was appreciation for it. I mean, there were those uh, collections like that one, like the stepping collection, um, where you're in, where you're really engaged with a very specific community. I, I, I'm always curious when I walk away from shows like that. I am curious. I'm not just saying I'm always curious. I actually am curious about whether you surprise yourself, you know, when you, when you, go home after a first night, as it were, and you're, you've surprised yourself with what you've done. Well, I, I surprised myself that I pulled it off um, uh, because sometimes they're tricky and, and, and sometimes they're, uh, they could go either way. There's some, sometimes they're, um, <clears throat> but I've always felt that uh, everything that I've put out there was um, put out with enough positive energy that they, it would be hard for them to be misconstrued. But I don't know. I mean, in this day and age, things could be misconstrued really easily. So I probably, it would be hard for me to take risks like that again. Mm. Um, and that's kind of a shame. I've thought about that. Um, um, I don't know. I don't know if that's true forever. Um, but it's a I, shame. It is I, a shame. Yeah. I feel that that's kind of the lesson that I've learned in the in the past um, year. Um, but that could change. I'm not really sure. Um, Do you think you were ever nihilistic? Oh yes, 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 yes. I mean, in, you know, in my earlier years, I was, I was, I was. Um, yeah. Um, immersed in doom, wallowing in it. Um, but fundamentally, I realize I'm not. Fundal fundamentally, I realize I'm all about hope and I'm all about the pursuit of good. Um, and when I think back on everything that I've been doing, it I, I, I feel like I was able to do um, beautiful things, but I was also able to talk about values that I believed in that I think a lot of people share. And I um, mean, apparently they do because it, it, it kind of worked. People have responded. Um, so yeah, I'm not nihilistic at all, apparently. But you know, um, the, the, you, you've always been so vocal about the artists, the other, the creators that you love. Um, the architects, the filmmakers, the painters, and and they were all terribly flawed. Yeah, flawed. But but also there's this another there's another interesting arc. I wonder if you can see yourself in that the sort of transgression to redemption. Whether you see that in yourself, that if if you look at the last shows versus the shows that I was seeing ten or fifteen years ago, maybe longer. Even, um, whether you can feel that in yourself that you've 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 actually come out of the darkness into the light just in time for I, a pandemic. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I have almost more energy than I did then, and almost more of a sense of, a sense of responsibility to to um, um, battle bigotry, the bigotry that I see happening right now. Um, I feel, I, I feel like this, this period of um, resetting and um, reflection, enforced reflection, um, has just recharged me. Um, when you say redemption, I think, I think I'm thinking responsibility. I feel like that I feel more than ever um, that uh, that there, uh, I keep repeating bigotry, but it's such an all encompassing word. And it, it, it applies to um, just such a, a broad range of things that, that frustrate me. Um, and I feel that I have more power at my disposal to and more visibility to to oppose that and it's my responsibility to use it um, 
I, I'm not exactly sure how, uh, how but, uh, uh, but. Yeah, I was just going to ask, how do you feel your recharge will manifest itself in your work? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard to say, but um, I've trusted my gut for the past 20 years and my gut is feeling raring to go. So, um, it, you, know, you know, stuff comes up and I'm always a little surprised, but, um, but here's hoping that, that, um, that there's, some, there's still some ideas there. Well, I have one last question for you. Um, in the light of what you just said, you've described yourself as the Dolly Parton of fashion and, <laughs> and the Iggy Pop of fashion. So right. who are you today? Um, God, I'm, I'm, who am I? Who, like a beach bum. I'm just, I'm, a, I'm just the Dolly beach guy. Huh? Dolly Pop. Dolly Pop, yeah. Um, Iggy Parton, Dolly Pop, Iggy Parton. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. So it's so lovely to talk to you and I'm really sorry we couldn't do it in person, but hopefully- Well, again, looking so. forward to when we can and it'll, it's, it's coming up. And um, again, um, you're one of the best parts of fashion, Tim, you really are. And well, I think a lot I'll of people- exactly the same thing for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. always a pleasure. Talk soon. Bye.